Gee. Um, we got two speakers in this session again. Um, the first one is the Wallace, uh, who is a senior postdoctoral researcher in the Energy and Power Group uh, in Engineering and Science at the University of Oxford. And the second one is uh, Dr. Hannah uh, Butnitz, or Butnitz I'm not quite sure. <laughs> from the Transport Studies Unit, where I work as well. So uh, she's um, uh, associate, uh, my research associate in urban mobility at the CSU. Um, we're going to run it like in 15 minute presentation each and then do the question and answers after that. Uh, over to you. Yeah. Okay, hopefully, if you um, hear me, so, but do, do you let know? Um, so, I have clearly have wide screen, so we'll see if the formatting holds up. But there are three key points that I'm going to talk to you today, about today. Um, the first is what might electric take in the future? Where will we charge and how will this impact the electricity grid? Um, so, the first one. But today is focusing on the UK. Um, but just to put that into context, I kind of wanted to give a global perspective of this. Now, this. In terms of the millions of cars sold per year on the left. Globally, of vehicle sales, cumulative numbers. So it shows that by 2040, around you know a third of it's interesting to understand that we're not just talking about a UK perspective here. This has been enabled by the fall in price of batteries. Sure, you'd be hearing lots about, but instead, I'll just give you a very brief overview. And you can see here that, um, from again, from Bloomberg, you do tend to use their graphs a lot. The price is to come down by 2030 to $62 per kilowatt hour. This is an old graph, but I find it. reality so far up till 20, kind of 2020. Um, so this seems to be quite reasonable. Um, This figure is kind of is going to be and so when we look at this with tool that the energy and power group has adopted. The Department for Transport Data is used and this is using data from 2021 Q3. So this is the to 80% in only seven to eight years. Right down there in the left hand. This is cumulative, yeah, between zero and 100%. It's going to be the same <laughs> geographically. And that's something really important to us. Between 
between different counties. And you can see here three examples. So we've got Britain, the UK in, in blue, and three years are going to reach the 80%. Show that in 90% of scenarios, the total for electric vehicles made sense. To our second question, which is where will we charge? 50% of electric vehicle owners charge at home privately using their own. Car space off road. So in the future, we're going to need to rely on public charging. This can charges, um, but these come with uh, higher costs, etc. There might be. That yeah. if you can stay this side, just Thank you. sorry for anyone who couldn't hear so far. Um, hopefully, this will be better. So, lamppost charges, which um, unfortunately they're not always on the right side of the pavement to make them viable, um, and also in areas of high parking pressure, they can be challenges. Another option, and the final one we're going to discuss a little bit more, is uh, charging in car parks. So yeah, as I said already, we'll need to rely on that. The, there was a tool that we've um, created recently called Gecko, which looks at identifying car parks, which are going to pop up in yellow. It then creates a five-minute walk boundary around those car parks, and then it identifies houses which are unlikely to have off-street parking within that vicinity, which kind of helps enable business model design or identification of um, car parks that might be viable for electric vehicle chargers. So you can see here, we're going to highlight um, some car parks which have no residential buildings that are unlikely to have off-street parking near them. So they're not going to be able to provide for many um, households that might want to charge their vehicles overnight. Whereas up in Jericho, there's a tiny little car park which is surrounded by residential houses who are on terrace streets where there might be quite um, a kind of at, um, an appetite for a charge point in that car park. The final point we're getting to, and um, these, these sections are much shorter, um, is that if we go towards electric vehicles, we have to be very aware of what time of day people are going to be charging and how that will impact the power demand on the electricity grid. So if, if you charge, everyone comes home and charges after work, we're going to have some big problems. Um, some work by one of my colleagues, Constance Crozier, has shown that if you optimise this charging, you are able to prevent that peak, which if it's uncontrolled is the blue line and you can see that that goes up to 50 percent higher than the, the normal peak power demand um, but if you optimize it you can prevent any increase in the peak power demand this is probably the best case scenario and so that makes us all aware of how important this optimization is going to be um, and there are many challenges with kind of control uh, especially when you've got a kind of disaggregated um, assets so one of these options to look at is that electric vehicles, they all contain a battery, which is what we need to charge, um, but they're also parked 96% of the time. And in that time, those batteries could be used as energy storage assets. So this is something called vehicle to grid. Um, quick back of the envelope calculations show that within, if we um, transitioned all of the vehicles overnight to be electric, you could, including buses, and kind of heavy, any heavy good vehicles, you could end up with two terawatt hours of battery capacity within these vehicles, which is enough to power the whole UK for two days. So we're not talking about small demand here, but this value um, and the vehicle to grid uh, kind of economy depends on how far vehicles drive um, and what markets are available to them. And at the moment, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. So there are challenges associated to do with battery degradation, customer engagement. Would you let somebody else control your vehicle? Um, changes to the market, which we can always go into detail on the questions, and also the competition from autonomous vehicles, which have a completely um, almost opposing business model. So, and that is the summary of my talk. Um, Christian. Yeah. The idea was to move straight to the second presentation and then have um, questions afterwards. <coughs> we can hear you. I was wondering if the online audience could. Yeah, I mean, it, it echoed a little bit.
decarbonizing transport um, than, than Catherine did. So I am talking about uh, EV adoption, uh, specifically looking at um, the charging aspect and policy for that. Um, because, and, and the reason that we're looking at that is that uh, sort of inequalities can come in all different aspects of transport. So when you're talking about EVs, it's not just about who owns an EV and who doesn't. There's things like access, how they can use it or not use it, and even uh, what their interests or understandings about those uh, electric vehicles are and whether that feels like an option for them. Um, so there's lots of different things about uh, inequity and looking at uh, EV adoption over time, uh, as Catherine said, the um, vehicle price is coming down. There is a secondhand market beginning to emerge, but that's not really helpful if there's not a, um, if people feel that they still can't use the electric vehicles or that it's not available to them and their need and meeting their needs. Uh, so that's why also because it's more of a local EV charging, whereas the price of EVs, for example, is 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 obviously in the hands of manufacturers and is multinational and everything else. And we're, so that's why I'm really kind of focusing on uh, policy for inclusive EV adoption from a use perspective uh, and, and particularly charging and parking. So um, the research that I'm presenting comes from a project called Parking Charge, which those of you who are here this morning heard mention here in Oxfordshire. Uh, which is installing um, uh, charging hubs in towns and villages around the county, uh, not in Oxford City itself. Uh, but as, as part of it, uh, we were able to undertake a national online panel survey of UK car drivers that were by certain aspects, so by gender, by age, uh, by region of the UK, but in, well, we targeted people who don't have off-street parking. Uh, at, at their household. So we're kind of trying to look at some people that are not the profile of an early adopter. Um, and in that survey, we did a state of choice experiment to really try and understand what preferences and needs they would have to be able to feel confident in using an EV should they have one. We also, um, partly through the survey, but we did do some uh, interviews around Oxfordshire uh, people who were interested in the park and charge hubs coming and there was a lot of publicity and engagement that the county council ran around them so we took the opportunity to talk to people and to understand kind of some of the more uh, what the social implications of uh, having in space so uh, one thing that was quite interesting in our survey was that um, skew towards that early adopter profile was still quite clear in terms of who agreed that they were planning to switch for the next vehicle. So it wasn't much those on higher incomes uh, and men who are the majority of uh, current EV owners. So how do you get the people that aren't that profile to think, no, I would quite like to switch yeah, that's the, before they actually can switch, do they actually want to switch? And these are people, so as you can see, uh, especially as you go down outside of the bars, less and less actually even intending to switch for the next vehicle uh, because of various reasons. So one of those reasons is that a lot of these people remember we were not likely to be able to charge from their home electricity is that they didn't think that there was any public charging nearby that they would be able to use. And that, um, so a lot of people had a lot of concern. And we asked questions, um, not just whether they knew where they could charge locally, but also whether they felt they didn't know how to charge locally. They're kind of carefully designed questions uh, that make um, if they were choosing a public charging, we concentrated on the type of, on describing their choices uh, in terms that they would understand that most car drivers would understand how they normally park their vehicles, so, you know, how, how much you, you have to pay something, how you would pay it, you have to walk them home, 
duration of stay, which is specifically typically with things like charging speed, because these are not people that necessarily need to live. Each person had to make six choices between an on street public charging option and an off street public charging option with various of those attributes and trade offs. And results, uh, once we kind of got them back and modeled them, uh, were quite interesting because although they were all in the direction we expected, um, there, was, there was a really strong um, skew towards people feeling that the location of that public charging had to be somewhere where they could walk home and feel comfortable and safe and, and that's how they use it. It was valued much more highly than uh, so if you try to look at categorized survey samples in this um, 2000 Um, their choices. And what we found is that uh, two thirds of them tended to prefer one third of them was basically valued so highly that you. Slightly higher income, you actually did an income. It's also security, so they, they value this. And, and actually, that's what it's Charging option more of the time, and uh, we had originally thought might be the more expected answers that they really wanted the convenience. Closer the better. The um, restrictions on the space the better. And so uh, I did some interviews around box switcher and, and kind of into more detail about what people um, both wanted, but also kind of, you know, expected from charging about a third of the people we interviewed already had. Since the had switched from a uh, fossil fuel power um, what people told us about it, the materials and what might change. So does the space change? Obviously, there's an engine or a plug or cable or what have you. Skills that they thought they needed to have to be able to. Interesting was that even those people, uh, they were most of the EV owners. That So, um, you know, had they, did they know how to get the better price, better electricity? Trap quite a bit of attention. Some people found it. And she felt that she was getting. Smug. <laughs> Evangelical. So we definitely get some of those as well. Um, 
should be charging in public. Sorry, 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 sorry,
charge uh, personal guns on campus. Charge for a few hours while the game is in silence. This is during this point, actually. What can we let someone know? I mean, I don't know if you want to say more about the electricity grid or anything. Eighty-five percent of what we're saying is okay. This is why. Um, I'll, I'll hold it anyway. Um, yes, John, I think you're totally right that the, the, we, we called it before the, like the chocolate box of EV charging storage, like EV charging solutions. Um, and I don't think that there's going to be a gap in the market for the ultra rapid chargers because all of the oil and gas companies are putting them in their forecourts and buying up ultra rapid charging companies. So I think for those people who do really desperately need to charge and get on with it, they'll be able to. But I think as Hannah said, really that fast charging is kind of the sweet spot where which will meet the needs of a lot of people. Um, your second question and point towards the markets, um, incentivizing flexibility in electric vehicle charging is a huge point. And um, kind of that ties in a lot with Project Leo that we heard about earlier and making sure that those markets exist um, for individuals and that also take the decision making and kind of that level of knowledge away from the individual so that you can sign up to a service provider who will optimize that for you and kind of basically deal with 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 um, using your battery as needed um, at, but also meeting constraints that you can uh, define um, to to them. Yep. Have you guys had the time to study it? Could you just say the name and oh, uh, um, uh, in okay. Oxford Uni? Uh, have you had guys had the time to study other countries to see if they've successfully implemented some sort of infrastructure to integrate electric cars? Um, also, are you exploring policies in order to reduce car ownership? For example, I don't own the car. I don't even cycle, but I'm blessed because I live in London and commute to Oxford. Um, Road. And yeah, do you think it's tough in the West? Because obviously we've gone through 40 years of capitalism and it's kind of hard in a for profit society. And yeah, when I talk about other countries, I mean, like, have you explored China, which is quite list? It's run by the Chinese Communist Party, so quite authoritarian, and therefore they can you know, uh, implement policies a lot quicker than we can, essentially. <laughs> right. So, um, yes, have been studied. Um, I'm in charge project to a project where we're working um, with countries in Europe that are in different stages in the transition to electric mobility, which has gone very, very far down uh, the route. Uh, which is, I would say, between us and, and Norway stage in, in switching to electric vehicles, and uh, in, in Poland, which is um, behind us a bit, is also uh, looking at what type of electric mobility um, is for them, so to speak. Um, so yes, there's, and, and there's plenty of comparative studies. I mean, there's actually a lot about electric vehicles in China as well, because they've been that so there is literature on it if you're interested 
um, different, not just government, but culture. So, so, so some of the things that are happening there are 100% applicable here. Um, Dream, but um, it's quite contextual. What is right for some places is not going to be right for all places. So it is, you really do need to be really That's part of what we want to do as well. Is do actually people want and need? It's not going to be the solution for everyone, and it certainly isn't the whole solution to decarbonizing transport. And I think in the Transport Studies Unit, we're very, very aware of that. Christian has done some great work on other modes. Um, and, and with all electric cars is not gonna solve the problem. It's only a part of the solution. And depending on where you live will depend on how big a part of the solution, I would say. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier, a country like Scotland, which is, of course, the nation of the UK. They have their own traffic reduction target for cars, 20% in the next eight years. They realise that they can't achieve the, their climate goals um, uh, just by electrifying everything. The UK has shied away from this um, as, as, a, as a country. So, so instead of say, yeah, 20% or even further. So the is to increase electricity capacity, you might need to move to nuclear, which a lot of Overall, I think it's not a big problem. You know, at the, as a country level, you might add 10, 20 percent to electricity load. Where you know, there will be hotspots, and it's very regional, localized, and that's still a question that hasn't really been answered. Maybe Catherine, I don't know. Might, might know. Yeah, sorry, Hannah and I were just discussing if we'd answered all three of them or if there was one we were missing. Um, but as far as, as far as I remember, it was about um, have we looked at other countries? Have we considered kind of a, a, um, a void shift and improve? So, it, yeah. The, um, and then the, the third question was to do with um, communist society, uh, sorry, uh, consumerist society um, and understanding that. And I think that kind of to answer that I'd come back to the point that actually it's not just all about the carbon it's not all just about the emissions um the emissions have a big impact when you move away from electric vehicles but actually electric vehicles also provide you with reduced kind of um improved air pollute air quality which is a huge health benefit which saves the economy money which saves the government money um and improve you know by improving the working workforce um and the labor force ability to work and also actually the cost of healthcare, but also um can improve um energy independence as well if you are able to provide your own electricity which is the point you just touched on so we need to remember that it's not Although, you know, a lot of us come at it from a perspective of wanting to reduce emissions, there are other benefits that governments may see as important, even if it's um, kind of a consumer based society. Um, uh, and the other point just for that as well, we, you know, kind of um, understand. Uh, oh, gosh, I've totally blanked on what I was going to say. Um, so never mind. <laughs> if it comes back to me, I'll catch you at the coffee break. <laughs> for the questions, yeah. It curve the, the the uptick that in eight years we go was it from twenty to eighty percent penetration? What are the assumptions behind that? So yeah, the modeling is done purely looking at the historic data. So there's no political intervention um, included in that. It's a best fit model looking at what's happened historically. So S curves are notoriously hard to forecast. Um, and, you know, you need to understand that there's always variety, uh, kind of, you know, that there is some, some uncertainty with that. But the advantage of the S curve is that because it is based only on historic data and what has happened in the past, um, it, it's not being swayed by any political um, intervention or any of those goals um, that we have. So the yes, S-curves are commonly used across adoption of technology and our world and data has this fantastic figure that kind of shows for a lot of household goods um, how, how they follow these really rapid um, uptakes. But, just because I'm kind of in, but, but I'm thinking political intervention aside, I mean, well, I, 
politics tends to come into something at some stage anyway. But you know, infra, you know, what are the infrastructure? Because the sort of the early adopters will have certain facilities open to them, you know, that make it easy for them to adopt, as well as having the cash up front and so on. of people making active mobility choices along the way you know I just I just wondered if there was anything like that fed in yeah so it assumes um kind of a constant ownership of vehicles so it doesn't take it doesn't take into account tra um, transition to uh, walking or cycling or active modes of transport um but all that you know and in some ways that would almost pretend you know it might not affect it might affect the number of vehicles on the road but it probably shouldn't affect necessarily the percentage um, kind of transition. But this doesn't take into account, this is simply the expected demand based on what's happened so far. So it doesn't take into account um, the infrastructure or saying whether there would be enough infrastructure. And I think the whole point around the S-curve is to say that we need to make sure that there is sufficient infrastructure to be able to allow people to adopt electric vehicles um, when and if they want to, um, well, or, or are made to by government legislation. Yes, given replacement rate in there. Yeah. Um, so it's well, it's it's just looking at what has happened in the past and and for and projecting that replacement rate into the future and the fact that um, early adopters are able to kind of buy a, but you know are more affluent and able to purchase earlier um, is shown by kind of at which point you get that that. Uh, kink in the curve and also then the laggards as well for those people who are unable to adopt or will find that more or will have more barriers um it kind of it slows down as well towards the end for the final um 12 and a half percent just to add to that the curves have changed so this okay. curve was yeah. developed initially a couple of years ago really priya started trying to build them and then you took it yeah. on and, and as addition, each quarter, the DFT releases new data. Yeah. And as new data has been fed into that, that since the, they shoot the, the model was first built, data points since that announcement will show up that they're a little bit higher actually shift the curve forward um can you did actually change it to make it more cumulative so previously when when it was originally devised it was uh just on sales mm -hmm. and then you you changed it to actually show the cumulative which i think is more helpful but I mean, as Hannah said, so for example, the ultra low emission zone in London, people, you know, a year ago were thinking about, okay, well, we need, maybe not a year, but you know, six to nine months ago, we're thinking we need to change our cars. Um, and that might be visible in the data already. And, and as Hannah said, it's come forward. So it's, we, are, we as a nation are adopting electric vehicles faster than the forecasts or this particular forecast showed six months ago, which is encouraging. <laughs> Yes, please. Um, so electric vehicles sound amazing, right? I mean, um, um, you know, just driving an electric vehicle seems to be something that people really enjoy as well, as compared with a conventional vehicle. And uh, the, uh, the whole life uh, Is, um, you know, what are, what are the dark sides? French kind of hypermobile society. Uh, and it's a kind of infrastructure that supports, you know, car-based uh, mobility, eating patterns and, uh, you know, the location of shopping centers and all the rest of it which some would say is not, not the way we really want to be going. Thoughts on that, the sort of, the sort of dark side of entrenching this kind of on the surface 
uh, very attractive emissions from transport. Feel like you've almost answered part of your question yourself there with <laughs> so you know urban design and um kind of societal design around electric the use of electric vehicles is potentially um as you said locking us in to using um energy consuming mobility um services so what one advantage sorry to come back to the advantages but <laughs> of electric vehicles is a more they are much more efficient in terms of energy consumption than an internal combustion engine is. So you can, you know, almost two to, two to three times more efficient. Um, so in terms of total energy consumption, that is being reduced. But at the same time, it would still be better if people were to walk or, were to walk or cycle. You don't want to, I mean, there is definitely some looking into rebound effects. So do people end up using their cars more yeah. because it costs less to use them? Which is 100% the case then do you end up driving more element, I think, you know, and I actually, actually, this was a study in Norway. Using their cars more because they didn't feel guilty anymore. And so there gets into all sorts of, you know, issues around that. budget uh, or treasury uh, if, if duty over time as everyone switches and not introduce some other form of taxation on automobility. Also a lot of politics involved and that is the big problem of the I think of electric vehicles <coughs> To me, a lot of it comes down to politics because well, I think politically, just because there are so many, and then they don't have to make the right decisions. And I guess it's probably up to all of us to. I think I just want to add one more thing to this, which is to do with um, battery end of life as well. I think it's just coming in from a totally different perspective, um, that making sure that there is the you know correct legislation in place to make sure that there's extended producer or man manufacturer responsibility. So kind of these legal frameworks um, that in, will, oh, and design for recycling, um, which will in kind of encourage disposal, you know, green and climate compatible disposal at end of life um, is something that really needs to be considered. And, and although um, there are less emissions over the lifespan of an electric vehicle, there's more emissions in manufacturing due, due to the mining needs. So that's why moving towards a recycling um, of the batteries would be advisable. Um, and there's also, you know, we just need to make sure that the sourcing of these uh, kind of min <laughs> minerals and, and metals and minerals um, is ethical as well. So those, those kind of issues. Thank you. So Blenheim School of Government. I was wondering, um, of government incentives for this kind of like a, a uptake of, uh, of, of the use of electric car because for instance I know that like in Madrid uh, if you do have an electric car take yet and I think that's also back to the idea of having like politics in mind you also have dark sides because like the, it's it's criticized in a way because it creates inequality between society. But I also think that another, for instance, uh, issue is the fact that like you have a to have a electric car, right? Because if you you need to, if you're a, like an only mother working at home, you can't go to the street at night like to to charge your car because you don't have that this time. Whether or not that in other countries they've figured out a way to kind of like make it more like if you've seen that these incentives are working, if they, yeah. I mean, I think um, I've not seen academic literature applicable to the UK. So, comments and things like that. Um, 
and I think there is some concern.